Hello there, this is Rick Miller here from Miller and Everton, and today I've got the wonderful Dr. Sarah Myhill here to talk to us um, all about the mitochondria and their important role within the body, and also potentially to talk about some of her specialist interests, which is in chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. I know it's going to be an amazing discussion today. Um, hey, Sarah. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, not at all. Not at all. How's your morning been so far? Uh, oh, uh, well, um, a lovely morning, saw some patients, did some work, uh, the sun is shining, um, so good, thank you. Super stuff, super stuff. So perhaps for those listeners who um, don't know you or your, your background, would you mind just giving a very brief overview sure. of, of yourself and everything you know? Okay, I, I qualified in 1981 as a conventional uh, doctor. Um, I then worked in general practice for 20 years. And during that time, I increasingly became aware that um, conventional medicine is not asking the question why. It's not looking for disease causation. And after 20 years of this, I felt I didn't have the clinical freedoms that I needed to be a good doctor. So I then jumped out of the NHS and I've worked independently since. And now I work as a naturopathic physician. So I rarely have to use drugs because if you if, if you can work out the mechanism why people have symptoms, whether it's headache, fatigue, arthritis, irritable bowel, it doesn't matter. If you can work out what the mechanisms are, then that has obvious implications for management. And of course, mitochondria are central to almost any pathology that you care to mention so um i could i could explain all disease through the my, mitochondrial uh, a scope if you like um uh, because i say they are so central in fact you know when i was at medical and, and this has changed so much because when i was at medical school in the 1970s we had to learn about mitochondria and mitochondrial mm. biochemistry for second mb and of course, it was the sort of subject that you mugged up the night before on black coffee and chocolate. You spewed it out onto the examination paper the next morning and hoped you'd done enough to pass. And the reason why it was of such little interest then is because in the 1970s, mitochondria weren't implicated in any disease process. Mm. You know, uh, when I after preclinical studies, when we we're doing clinical medicine, the word mitochondria was never mentioned. I started to get a little bit interested in them in the 1990s when I was treating my patients with fatigue syndromes and thinking, well, goodness me, you know, how does the cell generate energy? Well, it's mitochondria. Well, these people have, have got no energy. So perhaps we now know that mitochondria are involved in almost any pathology that you care to mention. And of course, I now see the whole of life through the, from the energy perspective. You know, if you've got and, and what a young characterized, young are characterized by loads of energy. They bounce around and do this and do that. And even what are the elderly people characterized by? Lack of energy. You know, they're walking along slowly. They're pacing all their activities. They're sleeping long hours. They're resting up and so on. And uh, and what links the two things are mitochondria. So if you look after your mitochondria, then not only will you preserve your energy levels right into old age. And in fact, there's an old boy who I look after who lives in my granny flat. Of course, I, I feed him a paleo ketogenic diet and much more. And uh, in July, we celebrated his 101st birthday. And he wow. is as fit as a flea. He has no hint of dementia. He's as sharp as a tack and uh, has no pathology, no cancer, no heart disease. Uh, and I'm quite sure it's because he's got jolly good mitochondria. So we all need to get Tony's mitochondria. And we're here to talk about how to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've kind of jumped to a few steps there in terms of the importance of the mitochondria, which is absolutely amazing because you're so passionate about this, uh, Sarah. Um, but I guess for just for those individuals who are sort of new to this or maybe they've got some snippets of what mitochondria are from other videos or other reading. Could you just give an overview to the lay reader? OK, well, um, um, energy to my mind, is one of the most important things we have. You know, with energy, you can live a jolly and happy and long life. And so we have to think about how does the body generate energy? Mm -hmm. And the analogy that I love to use is the car analogy. And for your car to go, you've got to have the right fuel in the tank, and that's all about diet and gut function. Mm -hmm. You then need the mitochondrial engine, and your mitochondrial engine, it takes fuel from the bloodstream. It burns it in the presence of oxygen, just like your car engine does, to generate the energy for your car to go along. When the car's engine is running, you can turn the heater on, you can go fast, you can turn the lights on, you can do it all. And then we have the control mechanisms. We have the thyroid accelerator pedal 
and we have the adrenal gearbox. And guess what? You know, I want a good accelerator pedal. I want a good gearbox so I can gear up. I can move up to speed to deal with demands. And then when the demand is not there, then I can drop back into first gear. I can rest up. I can put my feet up or whatever. And uh, it's balancing those things up which is essential to energy delivery mechanisms and mitochondria are central to this. They are our engines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned there about the generation of energy. I guess we could, we could, for those who are maybe got a science background, that would be adenosine triphosphate. So at the okay. end of producing okay. the energy. Well, so, so now you're asking the mechanic why the engine is working. Yes. And um, uh, the engine is working because of some um, fascinating biochemistry. Um, and uh, uh, the the, met, the um, biochemical process is called oxidative phosphorylation. And um, this is all about taking uh, fuel. And of course, I like that fuel to be ketone bodies. Uh, and we burn that to generate the energy molecule ATP. Now, ATP stands for adenosine tri because it has three phosphate. And that's made within the engines. So the next step is having made ATP, triphosphate, it then has to be exported out of mitochondria into the cell where it can be used to do a job of work. And that job of work could be to conduct a nerve impulse, uh, to contract a muscle, uh, to build proteins or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, that ATP molecule with three phosphates loses a, a high energy phosphate bond and it gets converted to ADP, adenosine diphosphate and that is then cycled back into the mitochondria where it's converted again into ATP. Now this process is incredibly efficient and just to give you some statistics to illustrate the point, um, throughout 24 hours we will generate about more than our body weight of ATP, you know maybe 80 or 90 kilograms of ATP depending how busy we are of course. Um, one ATP molecule cycles Potentially every 10 seconds, it does that cycle from mitochondria into the cell and back into mitochondria. And the, the pool of ATP in our body, i.e. the total amount of ATP in our body, is about 80 grams. That's three ounces. So when I think about these figures and how incredibly efficient this biochemistry is, yeah, I have to say I find it all quite quite mind-boggling. It is, it is. And just to think that somehow this has all come together over ancestry is, is just remarkable and we can appreciate obviously as as the listener that clearly these these uh, cell organelles are incredibly important for not only energy production but everything that goes downstream from there because without energy we die literally and you mentioned earlier that mitochondrial related dysfunction or diseases are basically implicated in nearly all diseases i think you said i think it was like 90, 90 plus plus percent why do you think it is that i mean if you went to a typical gp that I, I even myself as a dietitian obviously been a patient myself this is never talked about ever let's be honest um why do you think that is sarah like what what's what, what what's going on here it's very simple um the doctors these days are educated by big pharma hmm. and big pharma's mantra is a patient cured is a customer lost so the last thing big pharma want is cures because that's not good for profits, you know. It's uh, and profits are much more important than patients. Let's face mm -hmm. it. And um, you know, if I cure somebody because I take the dairy products out of their diet, or I put them on a PK diet and cure their hypertension and sort out their cholesterol problems, or I reverse their diabetes with the PK diet, or I stop them from getting cancer, or I stop them from getting heart disease, then I'm stopping the drug companies from making big profits because yeah. this is where all their profits lie mm -hmm. in symptom suppressing medication. Uh, I mean, the book that everybody should read uh, is by Asim Malhotra. It's called mm -hmm. A Statin Free Life. Cardiologist, he looked at statins. The benefit of statins is near negligible. Mm. And yet, atovorstatin is the most widely prescribed drug in the world worth about a trillion dollars a year to big pharma. So they have created this um, um, idea that high fat diets called high cholesterol that causes heart disease, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. But they've made the doctors swallow this. They've made the patients swallow this idea. And as a result, you know, the only answer is statins. But it's tosh. Mm. It's just simply the hypothesis is wrong, the theory is wrong, and the fact of the matter is they don't work. We can get if there are any benefits from statins, it's because they are anti-inflammatory, mm. mildly. And the reason for that is because biochemically they look like vitamin D. 
And mm. vitamin D is one of the most important anti-inflammatories in the body. So you can get all the benefits of statins and none of the toxicity or problems simply by taking vitamin D 10,000 IU daily. And don't think that's a big dose. That's not. That's, I mean, depending on how pale your skin is and how good the sunshine is, we can all make 10,000 units in maybe 15 minutes or maybe up to an hour. And, you know, and guess how much sunshine exposure primitive wooden woman got? She got 12 hours a day. And yeah, people absolutely. Worrying about 10, you know, one hour of sunshine a day. Sunshine is very good for us and is is is, is very anti-inflammatory, good for vitamin D. That's where we should be going. Absolutely. I'd love to come back to vitamin D a little bit later because it's um it's, it's actually something that came up in one of our last uh, episodes with Dr. Jalal Khan, who's a um, an oral physician based in uh, Australia and also shares the same kind of decentralized approach to medicine. And he was, he was talking about the role of vitamin D in oral health. And the importance, actually, of, of getting adequate sunlight exposure where possible because of the form of vitamin D that's actually formed, this kind of sulfated uh, form of vitamin D that gets around the body in a much more efficient form than maybe the supplemental. But as you say, if you just can't get it, then supplementation might be necessary for some people. Um, so obviously now we've understand why a doctor may not be talking about this with patients. Let's maybe uh, continue and talk about where it goes wrong with the mitochondria. So if we could think about uh, the lifespan initially, assuming that when we're young and uh, we're still growing and we've, you know, we've, we've not reached full maturity, presumably there is a certain amount of mitochondria that we have in the body. Um, and then obviously it starts to decline potentially as, as we age, correct? Well, my guess is it's not that the numbers of mitochondria decline, but the quality of their function mm. um, is what declines. Mm. Um, uh, I mean, the difference between somebody who is normally fit and an athlete are the number of mitochondria. Mm. So, um, and, and when you train as an athlete and you increase your muscle bulk, you're increasing your muscle bulk because you're increasing the number of mitochondria there. And so you're improving energy delivery mechanisms for, for the muscles so they can work more powerfully and they can work for longer. Yes. But my, so, so for mitochondria to work efficiently, again, think of the car. You know, you've got to have the right fuel in the tank and uh, the preferred fuel of mitochondria are ketones. Then there are some raw materials that they absolutely must have in order to function. So just like our car needs, well, my car needs you know, a spark plug and uh, a fuel air source and a, uh, an exhaust pipe and all that. The important supplements of mitochondria are magnesium. I think magnesium is the spark plug of our car. Um, coenzyme Q10, that's the most important electron donor and acceptor within mitochondria. And I think of that as the oil of our engine. We need acetyl L carnitine in order to get um, acetate groups into the mitochondria, the fuel. I think of that as the, 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 the fuel pipe that gets the fuel into our, mm, into our car yeah. and our engine. Um, we need vitamin B3, which is another essential electron donator and acceptor. And um, and then uh, it, to replace D ribo uh, to re de replace ATP if we have overdo things we need D ribose. So those are the sort of the five essential supplements for our mitochondria to, to, to function. And then we need to have mitochondria which are free from toxic stress. There's nothing blocking them. Mm. Uh, and again, you know, if you had a finely tuned engine and you threw a handful of sand into it, then that's going to block things in unexpected ways it's going to increase the friction in the system so things wear out quicker and so on and our poor bodies now have to tolerate or deal with a huge number of toxins the major source of toxin is probably comes in the upper fermenting gut and if mm. we're having too many sugars and carbohydrates we overwhelm the ability of the upper gut to be sterile and we ferment those sugars and carbohydrates instead and that produces toxins like alcohol, ethyl alcohol, propyl alcohol, butyl alcohol, D-lactate, mm. hydrogen sulfide, ammoniacal compounds. Um, and then there might well be bacterial endotoxin in there, fungal mycotoxin in there. All of these toxins have the potential to inhibit mitochondria. Mm. If I have a glass of wine, guess what? I feel all woozy and, and fatigued. Why? Because um, uh, uh, alcohol inhibits mitochondrial function, destabilizes the membranes. Mm -hmm. So um, the upper fermenting gut is a really important part of that. Another thing that causes um, uh, in blocks mitochondria is having lots of free radicals around and molecules with an unpaired electron. And we can mop those up with antioxidants like 
vitamin D, like vitamin C, um, like um, um, glutathione peroxidase, uh, coenzyme Q10 is an antioxidant, superoxide dismutase, improving antioxidant status is also going to improve mitochondrial function. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have other toxins in the outside world that we're being poisoned with heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, pesticides, glyphosate. These all have the potential to block mitochondria. So the more we can clean up our environment and be free from those chemical insults, the more we can detox with heating regimes like running and sweating and, and uh, sweating mm -hmm. regimes and showering off afterwards, then the healthier we are going to be. Probably. And then, of course, to say the control mechanisms of the uh, mitochondria, the thyroid accelerator pedal, and the adrenal gearbox. Get that all together, and you will have good mitochondria, which will keep you in good stead for life. That was a huge suite of, of different things there, Sarah, and uh, so brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And there's a few things that I definitely want to come back to, particularly as you touched on the upper fermenting gut and the ferment formation of these uh, things like acetylaldehyde and these other compounds that come from over-fermentation of carbohydrates. Um, one thing that's, that's, that's quite, I think, popularised at the moment in the nutrition world is the, uh, the relationship of uh, advanced glycation end products. And the problem is, is that when we talk about these compounds, uh, which for those listening in who have no idea what I'm talking about, advanced glycation end products are effectively uh, formed when we cook anything in the pan. Effectively, it's the Maillard reaction uh, for anybody who's a food scientist. So this caramelization and uh, you get it when you when uh, sugars uh, are, are basically attached to proteins. And that can that can happen in both, you know, typical piece of meat that you put a bit of honey on or something like that, or it could be uh, from say a very highly processed food, like, you know, a biscuit or whatever that's got the gluten protein. And then obviously it combines with the sugar that you have in the biscuit. Um, but the thing that's interesting about this is that with these groups that are talking about, oh, these terrible advanced glycation end products and how they're going to affect diabetes and, and aging. And again, they talk about the mitochondria and the role it has on free radicals, which you mentioned. They always mention meat. They always say meat is a terrible source of advanced glycation end products. You need to stop eating that. They never mention the the biscuits and the processed foods at all, um, which is really interesting. So I was just wondering if you had any kind of thoughts on that, given the uh, the, the PKD diet, which you've, you've mentioned a few times, actually, which we must get into in a second, has got a strong uh, emphasis on meat. And uh... no, 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 you misread that. Um, the PK diet is the evolutionary correct diet. Mm. It's not a high meat diet. It's an it's a normal protein diet. Mm. So we do, we know we're not eating uh, buckets of meat and, and eggs and fish, but they are obviously permitted on the diet because uh, there's no um, uh, carbohydrate load there. Right. Uh, and again, in a primitive you know man, much of his food okay, he he might have cooked a bit, but much of it would have been eaten raw. True. And in fact, there are some um, uh, bodies that say what we should really be starting off is with a raw meat diet. Mm. but uh and the paleo he turned out maybe is the is the end point not the starting point uh -huh. so it's it's cooking meats it's it's burnt fats that are the problem mm. so you know when we cook meats then no okay i do occasionally barbecue but normally speaking i don't eat burnt meats no. so for example um i've got some guests coming for supper tonight i've got a lump of beef so i put it in a slow cooker um slow pot so it'll 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 get it'll get in 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 saturated fat of course so it will cook, maybe cook that for a couple of hours, and then I will leave it for about two or three hours to rest. So the middle of the meat will be pink, the outside will be browned, uh, it will be absolutely delicious, of course. But um, there aren't going to be burnt fats uh, associated with that meat. Uh, and that applies to, to all meats. Having, But, you know, I do like sometimes meats burnt. I do like bacon, which we know has nitrites in it. But what greatly helps mitigate all that is vitamin C. Now, as you know, it's humans, fruit bats and guinea pigs who can't make their own vitamin C. So we need to take it. And I love people to have about five grams of vitamin C a day. And that greatly protects us against the, um, the Maillard reaction, the, you know, the, the toxins that come from burnt meat or from nitrites or whatever. Um, and uh, so I like those foods. So it's worth me taking the vitamin C. But vitamin C does lots of other good things as well. So, so don't think this is high protein diet. It's a normal protein diet. The key is... We should be fueling our body with fat and with fiber mm. because fat is broken down to form ketones and ketones are burned in mitochondria with minimal free radical production. Mm. This is one of the problems of burning sugar in mitochondria. If you burn sugar in mitochondria, you get a lot of free radicals. 
Mm. And, 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 they, and they themselves are damaging to mitochondria, damaging to DNA, and so on and so forth. So this is another reason we should be consuming, um, uh, running on ketones, because as I call it, it reduces the friction in the system. You know, that if we can live, uh, if our biochemistry can run in a frictionless way, Mm. then um, that's going to improve energy delivery mechanisms. But by contrast, you know, drugs, prescription drugs, social drugs, uh, toxins, heavy metals, pesticides, organic, all these substances, they increase the friction in the system because they work by blocking. Yes. So, um, uh, so this is why prescription drugs are so pernicious to mitochondria because many of them inhibit their function obviously the classic is a statins mm. statins stop us from making endogenous coq10 and therefore the mitochondria don't function well because the as, as i call it the oil in the engine is not there and um and we don't have the coq10 to mop up those free radicals from sugar mm -hmm. uh, beta blockers you know block um mitochondria many antidepressants do as well so the key is what, whatever we're doing whichever treatment we're looking uh, at we want to reduce the friction in the system uh, mm. so that mitochondria work more efficiently. And as you say, I mean, thinking about ancestrally how the diet and the mitochondria would have been supported. You know, we talked about this balance before, this kind of redox balance between the antioxidants and the oxidants that are building up in the system through the engine being used, as it were. Um, primitive human beings would never have had to worry about this as such because they had that balance right. They were in touch with nature. But now there's so many things coming in as you say the toxic the toxins you know the environment that we live in the diet that we eat the uh, the drugs that we prescribe to ourselves the the load towards the oxidation we're just burning the engine out completely and as you say if you go on this the pkd diet you're helping to give the engine what it needs effectively to run to run properly Correct. Um, and as a result of all that life expectancy is now falling for the first time mm. for some centuries yeah. i'd love to come back to um we've started to get into this topic of how we can how things can go wrong with the mitochondria the end point of that you're one of your specialist areas is is within chronic fatigue syndrome and me and it's being now finally recognized that these are mitochondrial related disorders whereas when i certainly even just in the time that i've been a dietitian which is uh you know only only about 15 years even then they weren't really talking about it in that context at all. It was always that th these individuals were thrown off to the psychiatry department, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it's just shameful. I think when I think back, you know, how we manage these patients. Um, but you've got a very, very different perspective and I'd love you just to walk us through that if that's okay, Sarah. Okay. Well, um, you know, I've been interested in chronic fatigue syndrome since the early 1980s. <laughs> Uh, and and then I um, I didn't have many tools, as I called it, you know, because uh, there was no inkling as what was causing chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, I knew I could improve some by um, um, you know changing their diets because they were maybe allergic or whatever. I knew I could improve some by sorting out the chronic infection. Some of them had an underactive thyroid or whatever, but I knew I wasn't really grasping the nettle. And it was in the 1990s that I started to work very close with John McLaren Howard at, um, he was then at Biolab Laboratories uh, and then moved on to set up his own laboratory, Acumen. And he is the most brilliant biochemist. If anybody should receive the Nobel Prize for biochemistry, it should be Dr. John McLaren Howard. Mm. And I said to him then, what about mitochondria in patients with fatigue syndromes? And to cut a very, very, very long story short, he developed a test of mitochondrial function. Now, we can now get this test done with uh, Professor Brigitte, uh, Brigitte Koenig in Germany through um, the Academy of Nutritional Medicine. But John was the guy who set this test up originally. And in the 2000s, I by then had collected patients who were not improving with my regimes, and I wanted to do mitochondrial function tests on them. Mm. And we set up a study. So I collected 71 patients and we agreed um, a level of energy between them. Well, are they 50% of what they should be, 30% of what they should be, 70% of what they should be or whatever. I then took blood and sent it down to Acumen. John did the blood test. He didn't know how ill the patients were. He was just doing the mitochondrial function tests. And then the results went to a third party. That was Professor Norman Booth at Mansfield College, Oxford. He had an interest in, in ME because his wife was a sufferer. Mm. So he had the patient scores from me, the biochemical scores from John McLaren Howard, uh, and he wrote the paper that we published in 2009. And essentially that showed that those patients with the worst level of fatigue 
had the worst mitochondrial function and vice versa. So okay. that was a uh, that, that was the first paper really that showed that that uh, chronic fatigue syndrome has a has a has a pathology. It's micropathology. It's pathology of the mitochondria. You can't see it. You have to measure it functionally. Mm. And having achieved that, then I was able to give each patient uh, a um, a package of treatment that addressed those defects, whether it was inhibition, whether it's blocking and detox regimes whether it's deficiencies, so they need supplements of this, that, and the other, whether it's the diet or whatever. And um, we published a third paper in 2013, I think it was, uh, where we looked at the mitochondrial function test after their regimes. Now, 30 of the patients had put in place the regimes, and every single case, their mitochondrial function improved markedly. Four patients, for whatever reason, had not done the regimes, and their mitochondrial function got much worse. And it was such an extraordinary correlation that although the numbers are very small, mm. um, uh, it was able to, we were able to publish that. But the point about this is we now know how to fix the mitochondria. We, you know, we don't have to do expensive tests to get our patients well. We just have to put in place the interventions, the diet, sort out the upper gut, up, the package supplements, the detox regimes, the thyroid accelerator pedal, the adrenal gearbox, and the mitochondria can go. Mm, that's a good one. And- as you say, if you if you diagnose the condition properly, then you can put all these different things into place and obviously give these individuals such huge relief. Could it be said, uh, Sarah, that because there, there will be certainly people listening in who are thinking, you know, I'm 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 often very tired, and I would imagine as a as a GP uh, that t- tiredness and fatigue and poor energy levels are something that lots of patients present with. What would you say is the difference between somebody who has chronic fatigue and somebody who is just maybe just not taking care of themselves properly? And is there a link there still with the mitochondria, even at a very fundamental level at all? Absolutely, yes. What you have to remember is that fatigue is a very important symptom. Hmm. We all have a certain bucket of energy to spend in a day, which might be determined by our fitness, by our diet, by our mitochondria, whatever. Now, if we spend more energy than we have available to us, then we die. We die because we don't have the energy for the heart, for the brain, for the gut, and so on. Mm. And so as that energy, as that gap narrows, as we start to spend more and more energy, the body and the brain have to give us nasty symptoms to stop us from doing things. Mm. And because they say, if we don't stop, then we die. Now, we all know roughly how much energy you know, we should have from people around us, you know, what they do. And we all know when we burnt the candle at both ends and overdone things. But essentially, the difference between normal fatigue and pathological fatigue is the next day. So my fatigue syndrome patients, they're pacing their activities carefully. They try not to overdo things uh, because they know if they do, they will pay for it the next day with even worse fatigue. And that might last two or three days. So the delayed fatigue is abnormal. It's a little bit like an athlete in training. Yes. You know, athletes in training, there's a certain amount of energy activity they can do for optimal fitness. Mm. If you overtrain, uh, you pay for it the next day, and your and your um, performance will fall. Mm. So you know, and and you know, I don't pretend to know anything about training athletes. I just know the principles. And you'll have you have a coach there who who knows from experience or whatever. Right. Do this much, do this much, a bit less. Do this much, do a bit less, because after an Olympic medal performance, you're going to be tired next day. You're going to be mm-hmm. exhausted next day. You're certainly not going to be able to repeat that performance next day, and that's pathological fatigue. Because when you really push yourself to your limit, you actually get muscle damage. You're actually damaging your mitochondria, and that yeah. takes some days to recover. Absolutely. So we are all on this energy spectrum, you know, and. Uh, me to a top athlete you know I've got chronic fatigue syndrome compared with you know an Ironman runner um, uh, uh, but my patients got chronic fatigue syndrome compared to me you know compared to when I was 18 I've probably got a mild chronic fatigue syndrome but you know I'll, I'll, I'll settle for that you know, yeah. when I was when I was young I could start at six in the morning and work till 10 o'clock at night I can't do that anymore you know I like to finish at four o'clock in the afternoon and then I walk the dog and cook the supper and, and do all those things so you know and, and that's fine you know I'm very happy with the energy of that I have I have as much as I need to do my work and to enjoy myself but um, um, you know it's relative that's quite and, and as you said before it's it's not that necessarily the number of mitochondria have have gone although I have read about this 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 idea of a heteroplasmy you know actual death of, of mitochondria which can happen over time uh, but you're suggesting that 
basically they become less efficient. They're kind of, the, the engine becomes a bit more broken. They don't work as well. They're a bit leaky potentially. And so, as you say, what we could do at 18, we now can't do when we're, you know, 78 necessarily, because we just don't have the, uh, the energy store, as it were, to, Correct. to do that engine. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, actually, obviously, we, we obviously work with men at Miller and Everton. And we've just talked about this idea of kind of fatigue, and then the end point being potentially something like chronic fatigue syndrome. Is chronic fatigue syndrome is it more prevalent amongst men or women or what, what are the sort of the differences well, between, the, between the sexes the, the, fir the first point here is that mitochondria are all, all female mm. mitochondria come down the female line we inherit them from our mother and her mother and her mother and so on mm -hmm. so um so that's the first point so we don't have any male mitochondria we don't have any female mitochondria the essential engine you know is is, is absolutely the same yes. um, um so i don't think mitochondria men are any different if anything, chronic fatigue syndrome is much more common in women. Yes. Um, and I've collected 1,036 patients who have all had mitochondrial function tests. And when we totted them up the other day, over two thirds were female. Mm. Um, um, uh, and I have to say there was a high proportion of vegetarians and vegans um, within that. So I'm not saying okay. that you know, you know, a, a vegetarian diet done well is just as healthy as an omnivore, an omnivorous diet. But say, so many vegetarians run on sugars and processed foods. But my guess is that the reason we see more fatigue syndromes in women is because um, they get put on HRT and they get put on the pill. And we know HRT and the pill induce metabolic syndrome. They make you crave sugars and carbohydrates, and that drives um, um, uh, uh, diabetes metabolic syndrome, being overweight, and also cancer. Interesting. So um, I am not a fan of the pill and HRT. I think they are uh, extremely damaging, and um, and I would tell my people, to, patients, to avoid them. Conversely, in men, obviously, we're, we're starting to see the, the advent of this age of the, uh, the andropause, and uh, men being placed on TRT as opposed to HRT. Is there any role of uh, testosterone in protecting maybe against uh, the, the decline in mitochondrial function but, until it's your, into your knowledge? Or... Not, not, not that I'm aware of, although I, I have to say I haven't, I, I'm not, I haven't seen, I only believe what I see with, with the evidence of my own eyes. So I, I, I don't use testosterone replacement therapy, but what it does do is we know it in, increases muscle bulk mm -hmm. and, and that muscle bulk is achieved because it's driving, it's, it's, it's mitochondria. Yes. So, you know, Testosterone, I'm sure, increase your number of mitochondria. And perhaps that's no bad thing. Um, in fact, I mean, one of the reasons I don't like estrogen and HRT is they're growth promoting, and we know that's a risk factor for cancer. Mm. But um, what we also know about cancer is it is it we have cancer, it's a metabolic disease. Mm. Cancer occurs when something goes wrong in the mitochondria, not the cellular DNA. And the classic experiment that was done to demonstrate this is two lines of cells in, a, in vitro, one line of cells which are cancerous and the other lines of cells which are normal. Now, if you take the nucleus of a cancerous cell and you put it in a normal cell, the cell remains normal. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you take the nucleus of a normal cell and you put it in a cancerous cell, the cell remains cancerous. It tells us there's something in the cytoplasm that's driving the cancer, not the nucleus. And we now know that this is mitochondria because mitochondria are responsible for cell suicide mm. um, through cytochrome A. And if um, uh, when that cell becomes diseased, it can't commit cell suicide, then that potentially is the start of a cancer. And we also know that um, a very good treatment to, well, certainly to prevent, but to slow cancers down is a ketogenic diet. Why? Because cancer cells, they switch off their mitochondria. Mm. They get their energy from fermentation. I.e., They get their energy from sugar and from glutamine, which is an amino, from amino acids. So if we can starve those cells of sugar um, by dint of doing a ketogenic diet, then we can greatly slow down the rate at which that cancer develops. Now, I don't say I see a lot of cancer patients. I, I, I see a few. But the starting point for treating them, well, obviously, by the time you've got a cancer, you've lost the battle. Obviously, you need the surgery, the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy or whatever to get rid of that you know, initial mm. tumour. But of course, what kills people is not the, the tumour, it's the secondary spread. Mm. And that's the point at which people come to me when they've got, you know, that they don't want to have secondary spread. If you put in place a ketogenic diet, um, um, high dose vitamin C, iodine, sort out the aforementing gut, 
um, exercise, you can do a huge amount to, re to, to improve your chances of that cancer not developing and going into remission. Absolutely. And, and I find it quite perplexing why this is even controversial information anymore, because just even yesterday I did a, a search on PubMed around that topic, um, the ketogenic diet and uh, effects on cancer. And not only has there been a huge increase in the number of publications in the last couple of years, but also even if uh, there is obviously a lot of uh, concern around people just using diet to manage cancer, and I can totally understand why that might might be the warning. But even when using the ketogenic ketogenic diet, it appears to be um, additive to chemotherapy treatment. So you've kind of almost got nothing to lose. You're going to go through the the rigors and the horrors of ke chemotherapy anyway. Why not give your best chances? Because the data seems to suggest that it's it's very beneficial. Sure. And and you know uh, and and you know if I have patients who are having chemotherapy, I yes they I say ketogenic diet, but then fast during the day of chemotherapy, mm. and that massively improves the efficacy of chemotherapy. And by rescuing with vitamin C and iodine supplements afterwards, that hugely reduces the side effects from the chemotherapy. Um, insulin potentiated chemotherapy is a well recognized intervention by giving people a little dose of insulin for their chemotherapy, and of course the blood sugar has to be very very closely monitored. If you bring the blood sugar down very low the chemotherapy is so much more efficacious mm. um, so yeah these are very simple techniques which we can use in parallel with with con conventional therapy uh to make it far more work far better with far fewer side effects that's very interesting so i mean i would not actually heard about that uh that sort of use of insulin as well to try and yeah, get a bit more of an efficacy with with chemotherapy very interesting as well and um, I just want to come back again to this. We, we touched on a couple of times there about athletes and muscle building and men. And one thing that I heard recently through uh, Dr. Jack Cruz, uh, who's a, a neurosurgeon for those who don't, um, don't, don't know of him, who's also um, a, a strong advocate for mitochondrial health uh, and also the, the, I guess, the environmental effects that are important to their health. So things like light, um, avoiding excessive electromagnetic field exposure, uh, avoiding obviously toxic blue light, you know, all the time, getting up the sunrise, all these things that we promote at Miller and Everton. One thing that he mentioned recently on a podcast when he was talking to some other guests around building muscle mass is that one thing that differentiates us as human beings from our closest relatives, some would say in our clade, which is the great apes, so gorillas and chimpanzees, is that they apparently bury their mitochondria in their muscle and we bury the majority of our mitochondria in our brain and in our heart our cardiac tissue and he meant he suggested that these athletes who are doing excessive hypertrophy so lots of muscle building um but then not doing all the other things to protect the mitochondria like for instance they're training inside all the time they're not getting good sunshine they're on their phones all day long that that actually might be quite deleterious and so it got me thinking uh, uh, between us uh, jack and i that these gentlemen could be doing all the things right in inverted commas but because they're not looking after their mitochondria, in fact, they could be setting themselves up for um, a fall later on. And uh, I wonder if you've got any thoughts about that, about especially for men who overall probably tend to chase muscle building more than women, whether there's maybe an optimal level that they should be aiming for. I'm, I'm sure that is the case. And believe you me, you can have people who are fit, but not healthy. Quite. So I've seen people you know, doing uh, incredible uh, uh, endurance events. And when you do their blood test, you find that they are not mm. I mean, low white cell count or um, uh, there's evidence of, of a high enzyme tests showing muscle damage or whatever, whatever. Mm. So, yes. And, you know, my view is we need to be fit enough for the job that's, that we are we need to do. Yes. And, you know. Again, go look at wildlife, you know, um, you know, do I see, you know, badgers doing press ups every morning or running around the field to keep fit? No, no, it doesn't happen. <laughs> what, what, what happens in nature is there's a predator prey, you know, um, interaction maybe once a week when you either have to run for your life to stop becoming breakfast or run for your life in order to get supper. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm a great advocate. Uh, I don't know if um, uh, you know of the uh, work by uh, Doug McGuff, and he wrote a book called Body by Science. Mm. And he reckons he can get an athlete to Olympic level fitness in 12 minutes a week. Wow. Now, uh, and what that means Big is claim. very intensive um, work of individual muscle groups. Mm. So what stimulates more mitochondria is lactic acid. 
Mm -hmm. So you do whatever exercise you need to do to make your muscles ache. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you stop and that's all you need to do. Now, so, so what I do to keep to keep strong and not fit, but to keep strong is I do press ups. So I do 30 press ups every morning, 30 squats. And by the end of it, my pulse is going about 130 beats per minute and I'm puffing and blowing. And that's all I do to keep strong. And press ups obviously exercise your arms and your core muscles mm. and the squats do the legs. And then for the rest of the time, I'm tootling around. I'm walking the dog. I'm riding my horse. I'm uh, working in the garden. You know, nothing excessive because I don't want to strain muscles. And so I'm sufficiently fit for what I want to do. Right. Um, and my view is that, okay, muscles might look very beautiful. They might make you be good for your ego, but it's not necessarily making you any healthier. Um, mm. So only you know, develop the muscles you need for the, for the job that you have to do. And that way you will live to your full potential. It's a it's it's a really good point, sir. And I think it is something that's lost. I think on um, you know today's kind of social media driven, uh, I guess aspiration. Uh, there's a lot of influencers around who are doing this kind of the kind of the uh, the bodybuilding and the uh, the building up, you know, and and fixating on how they look. But as you say, they're not thinking, what's what am I doing to myself inside as a cost of doing that and. Unfortunately, nothing in life is free, really, in that sense. It's you're stealing from one thing, aren't you, uh, uh, at some level. That's very interesting. So um, just on on that topic as um, of kind of external factors that could influence mitochondrial health, we, you know, we, we touched a couple of times on like sunlight. Um, I know grounding is certainly supposed to be very important as well, again, to help with electron flow and something that we do uh, promote at Miller and Everton. What do you do? Um, do you feel that this is this is important for, for mitochondrial health? Is it something that you speak to your patients about um, on a practical level? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, as I say, live life like primitive woman. Now, I don't want to go around, you know, in the freezing cold with a rabbit skin, skin loincloth on. So I want to get the best of, of, of the, of the uh, old world and the best of the new world. Yes. So I, I live in a house where I've got a wood burning stove. So I'm never cold because, you know, I don't like being cold. Uh, I'm very happy that we have food security. So I'm not going to starve in the winter. Um, I eat, I do do time limited eating. So I eat mm. all my food within mm. a six hour window of time. And the reason for that is that if you're in ketosis and I am all the time and I know that because I measure it after 16 hours of fasting, you switch on autophagy, autophagy, self eating. Mm. Mm. And during autophagy, what you do is the immune system effectively does a spring clean it mops up all those old proteins those cancer cells you know those dangerous proteins that are that are circulating in the bloodstream and mm -hmm. cleans things up so you know i'm thinking at the, both, at the moment i'm getting the best of both worlds because i'm never hungry because you know um, i'm keto that's the job of keto and i'm protecting myself from damage um uh, because i'm switching on autophagy for a two-hour window every day I see and and you mentioned that i mean obviously fasting and some time restricted feeding are very very popular strategies at the moment you have different variations on that people doing 24 hour fast multiple day fast dry fast you know uh the morning they're skipping breakfast the evening what's what's your recommendation and approach with this and does it matter from your i i i I, I don't know enough about this to really know, but just as long as you do some intermittent fasting, mm. that's going to be good. So, for example, Thomas Seyfried, who is the cancer expert, he reckons that if we all, if the whole world did a week's fasting once a year, you would halve the risk of cancer throughout the world, you know, overnight. Wow. And, I, and that's what he says. I don't know if it's right or wrong. And you know, I have done a five day fast, um, which was fine. I mean, the good thing about fasting is you don't have to shop, you don't have to cook, you uh, don't have to the table, there's no washing up. It does have its advantages. And of course, when you're in ketosis, you know, you don't get hungry. Now, when I say you don't get hungry, you might get a tummy rumble. You might mm. get the, the gut saying, oh, come on, I'd like to have something to eat. But if you ask yourself, have I run out of mental energy? No. Have I run out of physical energy? No, I'm still fine. So, you know, if you really ask yourself, have I got the energy? The answer is yes. It means that you're fat burning efficiently, that you're you're functioning well. And of course, guess what? You know, did primitive woman get three meals a day? No, of course she didn't. You know, she fe she feasted and she fasted during the autumn when there was a um, a windfall. There were free fruit. There was loads of apples, I mean, potatoes, beans, grains. You know, because she was harvesting. Then um, uh, and they are all carbohydrate based foods. That would have switched on the carbohydrate addiction gene. She would have eaten and eaten and eaten carbohydrates, and she got fat. And fat is survival value for the winter. Mm -hmm. and of course, 
she was eating carbohydrates like that because she was addicted. She got addicted to them and couldn't stop. But of course, when they ran out, she had no choice but to stop eating them. Mm. And so she automatically returned to ketosis and through that would run um, uh, throughout the winter and the spring and maybe some of the summer, you know, on ketones, maybe with occasional kill, occasional hunt in order to, um, to, to feed. But she would have fasted and feasted. We don't do that these days because we have the, you know, the supermarkets are open seven days a week, 365 okay. days a year. Yes. Um, so uh, and, and therefore the carbohydrate addiction gene is never switched off. Nice. It's permanently switched on and carbohydrates are addictive. Now, believe you me, I am an addict. I could happily become a carbohydrate addict um, uh, because I know intellectually the malign effects of them. I don't eat um, any refined carbohydrates or sugars because if I have one square of chocolate, the whole bar would disappear. But I have the self-control to say no to the first square, but not no to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And the... So if there's chocolate in the house, it only comes out when we're all, the whole tribe are sitting around the table. We share the, divvy the chocolate up between us. You might get a square each, and then that's your lot, because there isn't any more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very sensible strategy, sir. I think for anybody who's <laughs> listening, you know, you know, literally that's it, and uh, it's all gone, which probably is what happened again in, in the past as well. You know, it makes me think of like a Dickensian novel, you know, everyone's sharing out their little portion of food around. <laughs> around the table and um, but you, you you did again touch on something that's that's really interesting there when you talked about this kind of seasonality of eating for for primitive people and and to be honest there are still groups of hunter gatherers that still eat in this way so we often talk about the, the hadza uh you know the katavans you know and uh, some of these other sort of primitive groups which are basically a window into our past as human beings I mean, obviously they're being gradually modernized, but they still live in a very traditional way and they are very much dictated by what's in season. So in the summer, the these the Hadza tribe are eating fruits, you know, from the baobab tree, they're eating honey by by the, the truck falls. And then but then by the uh the kind of the dry season and there's nothing left, they are they are just eating what's you know, the, the hunted animals that they can get out of the tree. So they're basically in ketosis. And it's something that we do talk about at Miller and Everton. It's very difficult, I think, for many of our men to implement this, but it's not impossible, I think, at all, I think with a bit of will, is to eat in this kind of seasonal fashion. So if somebody doesn't have a carbohydrate addiction that they're aware of, although, as you say, we all have this inert, innate ability to switch it on, but eating in this seasonal way where, you know, you eat maybe a few more fruits and things in in the summer, and then in the winter they they go away, it's probably ideal for our, our biology in many in many senses. Correct. And there's another very important reason for, for eating like that, because um, um, uh, what their last you know, three, four, five foot of diet it, uh, of gut is full of bacteria. Mm. So the colon, the large bowel, that's where the microbiome is. Now, we don't know much about the microbiome, but what we do know is that the more diverse it is, the healthier you are mm. now. Um, my guess is that in the microbiome, there is a predator prey relationship, just like there is in the rest of the natural world. And if you eat as gr a, a wider, a greater diversity of foods, then you're going to have a greater diversity in your microbiome. Mm. So that's another reason for eating seasonally. And on this um, subject, it's also very important, as far as possible, eat organic. Mm. Steffi Senna, wonderful book, A Toxic Legacy. It's being held as the, the second Silent Spring. I'm sure everybody's yeah. aware of Rachel Carson's book, 1961, Silent Spring, Organic Roins and how disastrous they are for the, um, uh, for the uh, ecosystem. But glyphosate is, is equally toxic. Mm. And if you're not eating organic foods, you will be consuming glyphosate yes. in, in large amounts. And we know that about 53% of the gut microbiome is sensitive to glyphosate. Mm -hmm. We know it's going to be killed by glyphosate. So by eating non-organic, you know, chemically produced foods, you are making your microbiome less diverse. And we know that's bad for health in many possible ways. So um, these days, I spend less and less of my patients' money on tests. I rarely do tests unless there's a, an obvious indication, unless we're stuck and we want to know where to go. And I say to all my patients, you spend your food you spend your money on the best quality food you can get, mm -hmm. the best organic food, uh, and cut out all the processed stuff, cook it yourself, and eat as broad a variety of, of, of diet as you can possibly manage. 
think this is this is a really good um, point, Sarah, because um, I was just talking uh, on a on a different podcast, which we've not released yet, with uh, Mark Kent, who owns uh, Osmio Water, uh, about the quality of water that we drink, and uh, he was talking about the uh, the presence of things that are known carcinogens like lead, for instance, you know, microplastics, uh, and all these other compounds that end up in our drinking water. And people are, as she sips a glass of water, very good. Uh, the there's a huge misconception that what comes out of the tap is perfectly safe perfectly drinkable but like many of these things as you said with the food with glyphosate you know atrazine some of these other pesticides and herbicides that are thrown on food liberally what a manufacturer or a government body thinks is safe is not necessarily not necessarily what's good for you overall and yes fine it may not kill you immediately but it's a slow death and this is why Similarly, uh, at Miller and Everton, we just say to our guys, again, drink the very best water that you can yes. drink, filter it, you know, get everything out of it that's, that's that's terrible for you, because unfortunately, the water boards are not doing that. Once it hits your house, it's not their responsibility anymore. It's your responsibility to make sure it's clean. Uh, and then obviously with food as well, buy the best quality you, that you can. And similarly, uh, just to just to follow on from what you were saying, if you remove all the processed foods, if you take out all the the, the nonsense you know frankly all the junk foods and things like this then it is it is perfectly possible for a lot of people i think to afford these types of diets depending on you know obviously budgets can be can be a bit strained but it is it's possible because you've got many much fewer foods to have to buy overall and shopping is a lot more simple correct correct and uh you know the paleo ketogenic diet it's a different diet it's not an expensive diet um um you know and if, if, you, if you have got a garden you can grow some of your own then then even better but you know it, again i would love all my patients to, to buy an organic um veg veg box and they're wonderful organic vegetable schemes for 20 quid a, a week or 25 quid a week you just get a box of um whatever's available and in season at the time and that's if you're not a gardener if you haven't got the time or the energy that's a fantastic way to get your vegetables and you just make sure they're all eaten up by the end of the week and then the next box comes along so yeah that's a really good way of doing it and again pre preparing foods yourself as i said earlier 70 percent of the food that comes into us is processed in some way and processing means that there are going to be hidden sugars in there. There are going to be a whole range of chemicals. There are over 3,000, I think there are 3,600 chemicals that the food companies are allowed to put into our food. And if the level of those chemicals is less than 1%, it doesn't have to appear on the label. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just don't know what's going on. And those processed foods will often include processed fats and oils. Mm -hmm. And processed fats and oils are so bad for our health. And the reason for that, I'll just give you the oil lecture because this is really important. In nature, there is no such thing as a bad fat. They are all good. We have saturated fats, which we get in meat, we get in coconut, we get in palm oil. And those are the ones, and they, they're called saturated because they're made up of a carbon chain saturated with hydrogen ions hmm. so they are a stiff solid chain the unsaturated fats means that one of those um carbons um has got a double bond so instead of being a straight it's a kink so that's an omega-3 fat that's kinked at the at the omega-3 position that's an omega-6 fat that's kinked at uh, um at the uh, sixth position and that's an omega-9 fat they are boomerang shaped they're bent they're twisted by the um the double bonds now, if you heat them or if you bubble um, hydrogen through them to make margarines, for example, some of them will flip into a mirror image shape. Mm. And that's called a trans fat. Yeah. And guess what? That doesn't fit our membrane systems. Yeah. That doesn't fit our enzyme system. That really clogs up the works and is damaging to us. Incredible. So avoiding trans fats is so important. And we do that by eating um, uh, cooking with saturated fats. I'm, I'm pleased to inform you now that the uh, fish and chip restaurant that, that won the best fish and chips for the year was um, used beef lard in order to cook their chips in. So always cook your meat, um, your chips or whatever in saturated fat, beef lard or coconut fat. And then oils, they should never be heated. They should never be hydrogenated. They should live in the fridge and you should drizzle them on cold onto your foods, onto your vegetables. In your French dressing is cold addition. You know, never heat them or boil them. So do not cook with olive oil or sunflower oil or any of those things because you're going to be generating trans fats. Mm -hmm. So it's a very easy and important thing you can do. And, and of course, most processed foods you know, are either hydrogenated or they're cooked or whatever. And they're full of trans fats, which are real bad news. 
It's really curious, uh, Sarah, um, but there's a very, very good point that you've made around the, the trans fat and hydrogenation issue. It's funny how uh, in the Mediterranean region, they all cook with uh, olive oils and, and things like this, which is which is interesting how this is uh, kind of transgressed. I wonder if we go back far enough that that wasn't the case at one point, potentially in the distant past. Maybe they were all using all saturated fats. Well, you, you say they all cook with olive oil. I mean, olive oil, I suppose, is the safer because it's only got one double bond. Mm. But mainly they're using them, you know, cold on salads um, or whatever, or, or maybe cooking very short durations of time. But, you know, um, we should be cooking with, with animal fats. But, of course, the Mediterranean, they have other huge advantages. Some of you have been probably watching the Blue Zone uh, series on Netflix, uh, um, which looks at where people are who live to great ages mm. so blue zones have a high proportion of centenarians yes. and what characterizes them all is they're all warm countries and they're all getting lots of sunshine yes and um, because of that you know they can sit around outside they can be sociable they can have a gossip they can have a chat um there was a lovely picture of an old man from costa rica and he's he was over 100 who's splitting wood for the fire in order to be able to cook yes. so they're they're all physically active they're all sociable um and they're all eating locally grown foods um mm. And, and that is what is so important for our health, mental health and physical health. Totally. I have a bit of an issue with the uh, some of the uh, the data uh, collation of the Blue Zones project, uh, mostly because it seems to be uh, pushing towards a, a sort of the plant based uh, approach. When actually, when you look at the, the the diets of those people in those regions, they they do consume you know animal products in in large amounts, absolutely in large amounts. So there is a little bit of cherry picking around there, but I think you're absolutely right. You you've uh, You've touched on the thing that probably matters the most, which is people living an out outdoors life and having that community spirit and being more relaxed overall. We know that stress is a huge factor for uh, a lot of a lot of issues like blood pressure and uh, and heart heart issues such as strokes. And um, I just wanted to just before I uh, uh, bring this uh, amazing discussion to uh, to an end, sir, it's been it's been incredible to talk to you. I just wondered, you know, in your in your current research and the things that you're thinking about with with the mitochondria, is there any kind of stuff that's on the kind of the precipice or on the cutting edge or something that you're researching at the moment that you thought oh that's quite interesting I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what role that has in mitochondrial health or, if, or do you feel like you've kind of figured it out at the moment at this no, point no 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 I've never figured it out and I'm constantly <laughs> on a steep learning curve I've never not been on a steep learning curve but of course the joy is in the journey not arriving isn't it <laughs> True. absolutely absolutely and, you know, and as I'm working it okay many people can be helped by these basic interventions but um, um, the real thing that has been so damaging to people's health recently is the spike protein from mm. um, COVID vaccines. Yes. And, um, uh, and that has been extremely damaging because we know inflammation damages mitochondria in a multiplicity mm. of ways. So, you know, that's the big question I'm asking at the moment. You know, how can we deal with spike protein and the inflammatory you know, effects of that? And what we know is people who've been vaccinated, they're still they're they're ex they're um they're shedding spike protein. About 50% of people who have vaccines will have spike protein on board and they are shedding it. So even people who've not been vaccinated may be acquiring uh, spike protein from others. Mm. And it's just, you know, we live in an inflammatory world and spike protein is just another addition to that. So the more so the harder we can work at putting in place all things anti-inflammatory, the keto diet, the vitamin C, the vitamin D, the iodine, uh, sunshine, you know, all that stuff is going to be very important. And um, you know, my guess is that, um, and, and this is work done by Paul Marrick, that way we can get rid of spike protein by intermittent fasting. Oh, interesting. And this is what one of the things that said really made me think, yeah, you've got to do this six hour window because I'm greedy. Of course, I love my food. Um, I've got to do this six hour window of time so that I have two hours a day when if there's any spike protein around, then hopefully autophagy or autophagy, um, i.e. self-eating, will then um, mop up that excess spike protein. What, and, and, was there a specific length of time that you needed to fast in order to get the, the well, spike? If, well, the, well, as I understand things, um, if you are in ketosis, then you'll switch on autophagy after 16 hours of fasting. Mm. So my mathematics tells me if I have all my food within a six hour window of time, then that gives me two hours a day where I'm switching on autophagy. And then every so often I do do a 36 hour fast um, just to be sure, um, maybe once every couple of months or something like that. Um, um, but my guess is that's going to be an, a very important intervention to, to keep us as free from spike protein as is possible. 
a shame that probably most people are sadly and probably not going to do that in the uh, in the as we enter into the winter months. But it's it's good for those listening in that there is a way potentially, you know, if you have been vaccinated, um, to perhaps shed some of the uh, the issues that might have been associated with with obviously that process. Sarah, it's been amazing to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. For for those dear listeners who um, who are interested in the PKD diet, um, I do actually have a copy of uh, Sarah's book right here, which I um, have read from cover to cover, and we do love in our house. So please do consider uh, getting a copy because it, one thing I'll say about uh, Sarah's writing is it is absolutely commonsensical, straight to the point, no fluff and that is very ref- that's very refreshing often with a lot of these uh these books is that they're often very impenetrable <laughs> there's too much too much mechanistic stuff so if you're not a scientific uh background person you can still understand this and you can implement it straight away so please do consider uh purchasing it and uh, and and obviously enjoying that and implementing it into your diet so thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, any closing re- any closing remarks for our, our listeners? What I always say at the end of all my talks, just do it. Don't yeah. think too hard about it. Just get on and do it and make the changes and don't let addiction get in the way. Absolutely. Great advice there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.